Come on, little YouTube. There we go. We did it. All right, we're live. Uh, yeah, so I warned Jesse. I'm going to warn everybody as well who's watching right now, which there could be some uh, surprise uh, background hammering. There's some people coming to work on our on our deck today. They have to do like they quickly put some plywood down before it rains, and and I don't know when this is going to happen. So it could be uh, you know in the middle of this conversation we could have uh, a nail gun going, but let's hope. Let's hope. Uh, hey, Jesse, how's it going? Hi, good. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's uh, you know it's sort of an auspicious time. There was a lot of big announcements coming out of TESS, and so I wanted to go through that and just plan it in general with you. But but before we do that, I mean, I think we've we've talked many times. But for people who don't know who you are, who are you, and what do you do? Hi, I'm Jesse Christensen. I'm a research scientist at the NASA Exoplanet Science Institute. And the major hat that I wear there is that I'm NASA's exoplanet archivist. I keep track of all of the planets we find around other stars for NASA. All right, so how many are there right now? As of yesterday, there are 4,368, I want to say. Confirmed. We just updated it yesterday. Yes, that's confirmed. That's we either have a mass for the planet, so we know it's, its mass and we know how big it is, or we have statistically validated that it's much more likely to be a planet than any other thing in the universe. And how many uh, candidates are there? Ah, that's a good question. So we don't keep track of all of the candidates in that any survey has ever found at the Exoplanet Archive, but we do keep track of NASA's exoplanet mission candidates. So there's another 4,000 Kepler candidates. There's something like 1,200 K2 candidates. K2 was the sequel to Kepler when Kepler broke. And now there's 2,000 test candidates, which is our big exciting news. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's so let's just get straight into that. We'll talk about tests, and then we'll kind of get more esoteric from there. How is TESS doing? We're two years on now and plus. How's the mission doing? Yeah, so we're actually almost at the end of the first year of our extended mission. Uh, so we had a two-year prime mission. Uh, we launched in April 2018, which was actually, my Facebook is throwing up all these lovely memories of the launch from, from three years ago, <laughs> right. which is exciting. Yeah. Um, so we had a two-year prime mission where we spent one year looking at the southern sky and then one year looking at the northern sky. And now we're into our extended mission. And the extended mission is going to the part of the sky we didn't look at, which is the ecliptic, the band around the middle, okay. and also revisiting some of the places we went before to start looking for different planets. And the big press release that we got, which I'm sure you had your hand in it, said there was so far 2,200 planetary candidates found by TESS in the first, like so far, or just in the two year, in the, in the primary mission? That's just in the primary mission yeah. and actually around uh, a subset of the stars. So we don't think that's even all of the planets or planet candidates we'll find out of the prime mission. That's a lot of the brightest, most interesting stars. That's what we found. There's literally millions more stars we haven't looked at yet. Right, right. Um, and so how many of those 2200 would you say have have been are pretty solid at this point? Oh, yeah. So we have over 200 um, confirmed test planets at this mm -hmm. point. I mean, the exciting thing about the test planets is the way TESS is designed, it looks at the brightest stars in the sky. So those are the ones that you can follow up most readily from the ground with more instruments. That's really the big difference mm -hmm. between TESS and Kepler for any of your listeners or viewers who are familiar with Kepler. Kepler found thousands of planets, but they're all around really faint stars, unfortunately. Like they're, it's exciting and you can do lots of very cool statistics with that big lump of planets, but any individual planet is hard to study in more detail. But the test planets are around stars that are much brighter. So we can actually go and like get radial velocities and start looking at their atmospheres in a way we couldn't for the Kepler data. Um, so there's over 200 that we've been able to measure masses for, which is very exciting. And, you know, really start to populate out like how do planet masses change as a function of radius and period and time? All these cool questions we couldn't answer before. So uh, there's, you know, in my sort of reporting on this kind of stuff, and I, I got to apologize to you and the rest of the exoplaneteers, we are not reporting on every planet that you find anymore. We don't have time. <laughs> um, That's okay. Yeah, um, yeah. It's actually an exponential curve in exoplanet discovery if you just yeah. plot the cumulative number of exoplanets with time. So yeah. it's totally okay. My favorite recent discovery, the literally the title of the paper was Another Giant Microlensing Planet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's just the title. Another. Of the, and it's like, yep. Yeah. yeah that's where we're that's, at. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, there was actually there was a paper that I looked at a couple of years ago where they plotted that exponential curve, and they estimated fifty million planets by about twenty fifty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mama Jack's law. Eric Mama Jack. Yeah. Uh, 
was the one who fit the linear slope and made these predictions. Yeah. Uh, and a billion planets at some point. So <laughs> I think I think we've fallen off that tradition that 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 trend um, a little bit. Uh, you know, Kepler really with these big lumps of validated planets that Kepler released kind of shortened the doubling time yeah. of this exponential to like 24 months. Now I think it's back out to like 29 months. Um, TESS is finding thousands of planets, um, but as I said, we've only looked at the you know brightest few hundred thousand stars and there's literally millions of stars for us to go through. Right, and so like, you know, TESS, although has been finding a lot of planets, is really, you know, a fairly more of a, a I'm trying to think of a nice way to say this, an inexpensive mission, an affordable, a thrifty mission. Thrifty, which is, that's a good way. Yeah, bang for the buck, which mm -hmm. is able to deliver as much science for the lowest possible budget, um, how how deep can it go? I mean, you you mentioned this earlier that Kepler's job really was to stare at one spot in the sky really deeply and right. dig up all of you know a much better survey of what a, of what space kind of really looks like. While Tess is just like all the low hanging fruit. How yeah, yeah, yeah. far up the tree can Tess eventually go? <laughs> so, how big is that telescope behind you? What's the size of that lens? Uh, that it's, camera back it's there. It's a it's a ninety millimeter. Okay, so uh, TESS is 100 millimeters. So TESS is like a tiny bit bigger than that. Yeah. Four cameras, just a tiny bit bigger than that. Um, so it just shows you what you can get if you take a tiny camera to space, right? You can right. do pretty well. Um, so we're expecting to find planets down to about 13th magnitude, maybe 13th and a half. But those will be the big planets that make the biggest dips around their stars. For very small planets like Earth-sized things, that's where you're, you're kind of trapped more up at the 10th and 11th magnitude range for your stars. But, you know, there's tens of thousands of 10th and 11th magnitude stars in the sky like we'll we'll find yeah. lots of things and then you can see a 10th 11th magnitude star in your telescope no problem i mean that's yeah that's that, yeah, yeah exactly so uh the trick is being able to see it change by a fraction of a percent in brightness right. that's, that's where we get you yeah yeah exactly um and so so will you get to a point of kind of diminishing returns do you think you'll get to this place where you're just you found all the planets that are there to be found, and now it's just not sensitive enough to see those changes in brightness beyond that point? That's really interesting. So we are still finding planets in Kepler data. Kepler launched like 12 years ago um, because of the improvement in algorithms, in, in, our, in software, in our ability to understand and remove the noise in the data that we see from stars and from the instruments. So we actually are able to do a better job at that iteratively. Like we can come back and dig further into the noise. Um, uh, at some point you do, you have mined out like what you're expecting to be able to see, but then you can just turn to more interesting science questions in my opinion. Um, so for instance, TESS, this big catalog of 2,200 catalog uh, candidates that we've put out, they were all found, they were all vetted by eye. And what that means is a computer algorithm identified that there was a periodic signal on this star and then a human had to come and look and be like, yeah, okay, I believe it or ah, that looks like trash and throw it away. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really good for finding interesting individual objects, right? That you're going to go study with James Webb when it launches later in the year or one of these large ground-based telescopes. It's not good if your question, like my questions often are, are about statistics, like how common are rocky planets? How common are cloudy planets and hazy planets? And do metal rich stars make more of this kind of planet mm -hmm. or that kind of planet? You can't do any of that with the sort of catalog that, this, that we produced right now. So what I expect to see in the future is much more statistically aligned catalogs where, you know, all of this has been automated and we look through the millions of stars just using an algorithm that we can test, like how well it's doing, like how many things is it missing? How many things is it finding that it shouldn't have found, like false positives? So when we do all of that, then we can answer a whole different suite of questions about the demographics of planets. That's kind of where I my interest perks up a bit. And I mean, it feels like, I mean, TESS has been so successful and again, so cheap, so inexpensive, so thrifty, um, like just a couple hundred million dollars and a, you What's know, a couple hundred million what, dollars compared to as we, as we wait with bated breath for James Webb to launch, right. closing in on $10 billion, yeah. 20, $200 million, <laughs> uh, it sounds like a bargain. Um, right. uh, what would a scaled up test look like? There's got you guys, you guys must have a plan for a test 2.0 because it, I don't know, it feels like okay. such a productive way to go about this, to sort of take this really well proven technology and then give it 200 meter lenses right. and then and then put it in that same beautiful orbit, right? The yeah, orbit so is- the orbit is fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, should we talk about the sure. orbit? Sure, yeah, we talk about the orbit, yeah. Yeah, so, so this is, I think the first time this kind of orbit has been used. Um, 
So there's multiple different kinds of orbits that spacecraft can end up in. Kepler was in a heliocentric orbit, so the sun is at the center, and it's kind of trailing the Earth. So as the Earth is going around, the Kepler is just following it like, you know, like a loyal dog or something, just following it around. Um, and that's really good in terms of thermal stability because it's staying the same distance from the sun. It's not going in and out of Earth's shadow. It's just sitting there and, you know, just getting the same amount of radiation from the sun all the time, um, which is great if you're trying to take very precise measurements over and over again. Uh, another classic kind of orbit are, you know, Earth orbiting, you know, geostationary or low Earth orbit, like very close. Like Hubble is in this like 100-ish minute orbit, but it spends its whole time going in and out of Earth's shadow, in and out of the radiation belts. And that's actually pretty rough for taking, you know, long time series stable photometry because you've got to correct for all of the spacecraft going, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just gets bombarded all the time. Yeah. Um, so TESS is in this lunar resonant orbit. So the moon takes like 27, 28 days to go around the Earth. So TESS is in this like elongated elliptical lunar resonant orbit. So it goes around twice for every one time the moon goes around. So every 13 and a half days. Um, and the reason that's great is because it spends most of its time quite far away from Earth in this elongated orbit. So it's away from the radiation changes and the radiation belts and everything. Uh, and, you know, spends a lot of time just getting the same amount of radiation from the sun. But it comes close enough every two weeks uh, to just dump all the data down as fast as possible. It's like this four hour window where we just download everything that it has observed in the previous two weeks and then it flies off again. Um, so it's this great compromise between stability and not changing things and also access to the data very speedily. Uh, so the orbit is seriously cool. In terms of plans for something in the future, there's a few different things. Um, of course, the PI of TESS wants to put four TESSs up um, and he just wants to have TESS like looking everywhere all the time. Uh, TESS has a very large field of view, but if you're looking for things like gravitational wave um, optical counterparts, like things that are popping off in the sky and supernova and all these transient things that come and go in less than a day, then it's very difficult for TESS to be looking at the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. If you had multiple TESSs doing like an, a, a quasi all sky survey, then you could really start to be observing a lot of these transient events more and obviously just find more planets, right. which is cool. I mean, it almost sounds like a, like a space-based complement to the Vera Rubin Observatory. Yeah, that's what you want. You want like, you know, all sky all the time. And it's so interesting. Every time our technology allows us to look either more frequently at the sky or more of the sky at the same time, we find more interesting things. You know, things like fast radio bursts have only been, we've only been able to see them in the last years because of the cadence with which we've been able to look at the sky and radio going up. Uh, so all of these interesting things only happen because the technology lets us do a new thing. So the technology with tests, you know, that we can do these bright patches of sky all at once. If we could do that for, for a large fraction of the sky at any given time, that would be super cool. So would it be would it be more tests or a better test? Which would be I mean, obviously, both would be, you know, more better tests would be even better. Um, yes. But but would would more tests or a better test be a, a more productive next step, do you think? So that's a really uh, fun idea. So there's a there's a mission that the European Space Agency is launching later in the decade called Plato. And Plato is like a hybrid of Kepler and TESS. So it's like 26 small telescopes. So the telescopes are still small. Um, that's really clutch because, you know, you can just buy them off the shelf. They don't have to be specially manufactured somewhere, which really reduces the cost. Uh, and also the cost for these things goes up faster than linearly. Like if you make it twice as big, it doesn't cost twice as much. It costs four times as much or right. 12 times as much. Like this, it's very, very important to keep the, keep the things as small as possible. So Plato has 26-ish, the number changes occasionally, small telescopes. Um, and it's kind of do a hybrid strategy. So where Kepler stared at one patch of the sky for four years and Tess is doing this like tiling of the rapid tiling of the whole sky, Plato is going to have a mishmash. So it's going to spend some time doing a tiling and then it's going to have these long stairs where it'll break occasionally and just stare at a patch of sky, including the Kepler field, which would be super exciting mm -hmm. um, for a little while. Um, so there you start to actually really get these complementary science cases of, you know, lots of bright stars, but also these deep fields. Um, so that's that, that's an idea that kind of plays off what you're saying, like more tesses or better tesses. That's like more slightly bigger tesses with this hybrid strategy of Kepler and Tess. Yeah, yeah. And and do you see other people utilizing this this orbit? Because it, again, it's just you know the moon is doing your orbital stability for you, and yet you've got all the advantages of deep space plus all the advantages of being close to Earth for communication. Yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. So I'm actually on the science team for a new MIDEX proposal. So NASA has these different proposal levels for different size spacecrafts, and MIDEX is like the medium size explorer. 
Um, and uh, we're seriously talking, this is a completely different, it's an ultraviolet mission, but we're seriously looking at this orbit and being mm -hmm. like, well, this is really, this is really neat. Uh, it might not end up working for us because one of the things we're really interested in the UV is these transients, is these events that happen very quickly. And the problem with the test orbit is you only speak to the spacecraft every two weeks. So if something happens, you can't just like rapid repoint. Um, so we might end up choosing something closer to the Earth so that we have more constant communication so that we can quickly redirect if we see something go off in a different part of the sky. Right. Yeah. But but we but, you know, everybody's looking at this orbit now because it's very, very it's got lots of advantages. Um, now, TESS has been described as the as the finder telescope for James Webb. And so now that we're at the point that that James Webb is about to launch on October 31st, yes, it's going to launch, there's no more delays. Um, have Are there any planets that you would really love to get a better look at? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, and not even just test planets. Uh, TESS has provided a bunch of planets. So for instance, there's the TOI 700 system. Um, so that's, uh, I apologize for the names, exoplanets all have garbage names, just straight off the bat, I'm gonna say that. So the TOI 700 system has three small planets in it around an M star, and one of them is in the, in the habitable zone. Um, so, you know, anybody who's been following Kepler and K2 and now TESS will understand that, you know, M dwarfs, which are the smallest stars, are the easiest to find habitable zone planets around. So that's where we've been finding the habitable zone planets. But we actually don't know whether planets around M dwarfs are habitable because of all of the radiation that these stars put out, which is very different from our sun's radiation. Um, so we have another system and it's a, it's a, hab it's a rocky planet around a, a, an M dwarf. Um, what we want to know is whether these rocky planets around M dwarfs have retained any atmosphere because they're so close. The habitable zone is really close to an M dwarf. Like these don't have periods of a year like the Earth. They have periods of weeks or a month, a month and a half. But if you're that close to the star and the star's putting out all this high energy radiation like UV and X-rays, maybe you never keep an atmosphere. Maybe your atmosphere just gets blasted away. So one of the big questions we have right now is do these rocky planets in the habitable zones of M dwarfs retain atmospheres or do, you know, possibly they have like second stage atmospheres where their primordial atmosphere gets ripped right. away by the young star, but then they outgas or there's delivery for comets or something. And then they have a, a secondary atmosphere, but we don't know that yet. So we're really excited to find that out so far. All we've seen are bare rocks. Right, right. But we don't have really have the technology to do this. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny, there's a bunch of these, you know, did were the dinosaurs killed by an asteroid or by volcanoes? Is the earth going to consume? Or sorry, is the sun going to consume the earth when it turns into a red giant or not? And are M dwarf planets habitable or not? And I just mm -hmm. get a different you know, we write the opposite story every six months yeah. or so for each of these topics on, on Universe Today. Oh, we're, we're just trying to keep you employed, Fraser. Yeah, I guess that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, someone comes up with a new model for, okay, well, maybe if it worked out this way, then then the planet could be protected from killer flares. And then someone else goes, nope, right. it's a death zone. Doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, I mean, right now, the methods of finding planets you know, back to that idea of it being low hanging fruit, you're really finding these things that are perfectly lined up between the, you, you know, with, with the radial transit, with the transit velocity method, with the, with the, um, with the, sorry, with the transit, with the radial velocity, both of them, you need the star and the planet lined up from our field of view. With mm -hmm. gravitational micro lenses, you get one shot and then you can never observe the planet again. Mm -hmm. What is going to take us into that next era of planet hunting that's going to show us the planets that aren't perfectly lined up the vast right. you know the 99 percent that we aren't able to see right now exactly so um that's going to be direct imaging um so direct imaging is you know kind of what it sounds like it's very hard to see planets next to stars because stars are really heck and bright and planets are really heck and faint but if you have very nice instrumentation you can block out the starlight and look around the star for planets um, now that method has found about 50, 50 to 80 planets so far, I want to say. Um, it's very difficult um, because of this contrast difference. You have to get to a very large contrast difference of more than a million in brightness between these two. So, so far, direct imaging has mostly been sensitive to young planets around mm -hmm. stars. So those are like huge gas giants that are still like accreting material. They're still radiating their heat from, from formation where all of this material was like smashing together to create this planet. Um, so we can see them glowing basically in direct imaging. They're putting out their own light. Right. It's much more difficult to find something like an Earth in direct imaging because Earth isn't putting out a lot of its own light. There, the contrast is more like a billion 
between the sun and the earth. So that's just technologically very difficult. Um, but people are working really hard on this and we have a roadmap. NASA has a, like an instrument roadmap going forward of how we're going to get to this like billion contrast. Um, the next step is really this next generation of very large ground-based telescopes. So the 30 meter telescope, the giant Magellan telescope, the European extremely large telescope. That is actually what they named it, the extremely yeah, large telescope. Yeah. Um, so Not these the, are very, yeah. they had to shell the overwhelmingly large telescope. Yeah, that's yeah. a shame because yeah. that was kind of fun. Yeah. Um, so these are these very large, like 20, 30, 40 meter telescopes on the ground, where basically because the dish is so big, you can actually get to a much smaller separation just because the light, you know, you've got this larger baseline basically between that side of the telescope and that side of the telescope, which is what you need to tease in as close as you can. Uh, so we're building up like all the first generation instruments for these large telescopes to have planet hunting capabilities. Like we're going to go look for these things. Even then, we're probably still not get, going to get to Earth's round sun. You need to go to space. Hmm. So NASA has these two ideas for large space-based missions in the 2030s and beyond that would do direct imaging called HabEx and Louvois. Uh, and these are two ideas that they studied over the last five years, like different architectures, different size cameras and and mirrors and science plans and stuff. Um, but basically, you know, one of them is going to cost $5 billion and one of them is going to cost N billion dollars where N is greater than, much greater than five. Right. Um, yeah. So that's kind of where NASA is like looking now. What we're all really, really eagerly awaiting the results of is the 2020 decadal survey, which is a survey of the entire American astronomical community as to what our priorities are. If this survey comes back to NASA and says our priority is a telescope in space that does direct imaging, then NASA will spend five or much, much greater than five billion dollars on this. But if the decadal survey comes back and is like, well, actually, we want to do all of this other really interesting mm -hmm. science that doesn't cost much, much greater than five billion dollars, then maybe those telescope ideas will have to wait. So that's sometime soon that's going to come out and we'll know whether or not we're going to focus on this for the next decade or not. It is. I mean, it is interesting at the same time, the the size and inexpensiveness of the launch providers are sort of catching up nicely. Again, like Tess probably wouldn't have been able to launch if it wasn't for a Falcon 9 rocket at a reasonably inexpensive yeah, yeah, price. Yeah, that brought the price down. Yeah, price yeah, down. brought the price down significantly. And same thing, you know, if you could, if you could lug a, a Louvoir over and put it inside a starship, because um, mm -hmm. I mean, I think James Webb, the lesson it really feels like James Webb taught us is don't try to fold your telescope. It's really expensive. Yes. And terrifying. <laughs> and terrifying. And very, very scary. Yeah. This thing will spend a month unfolding in space. I didn't know that. Days. A month, you know, really. Seven minutes of terror on Mars. This is going to be like 30 <laughs> days of terror as so, this thing like slowly unfolds and yeah. every around the world it's like ah. yeah we, you know we we made these four actuators go today and we've extended yeah, exactly. this much don't more. ask any astronomer you know to do anything in november because we yeah. are all just going to be freaking out so what about the astrometry method with like yeah so this so the astrometry method measures the position of the star on the sky very very precisely uh and if there's a planet orbiting it then as you say it doesn't need to be exactly lined up it'll induce some positional change some wobble um this is a really uh interesting method and it, people have tried to do it for years um it hasn't been very successful so far because it turns out stars don't just stay in the same place on the sky all the stars are moving all the time because the earth is moving around the sun so all of the stars are in the whole galaxy are kind of having this one year parallax because we're going around the sun which you try and correct for but it's very difficult um, to get all those residuals out um, but there is this european mission called gaia which is happening right now uh, which came up with this no novel method of very precisely measuring the positions of the stars on the sky and importantly their velocities like what direction are they moving in and how fast are they going a, that's helping us create this incredibly interesting and fun detailed map of the galaxy and pulling out all these streams of stars where the galaxy kind of ate a bunch of other galaxies uh, over the last, you know, 10 billion years. Um, but B, it means we finally have the precision on the positions and the movement of the stars that we can start to say, okay, around this vector of motion, is it doing something? Like, is there a planet pulling it around? So Gaia was actually predicted to find something like 10,000 mm -hmm. gas giants like Jupiter uh, in, over its mission. Um, it's actually still operating right now. Uh, it hasn't published any astrometry planets yet, 
Uh, it was able to publish a transiting planet after all of this, like, you know, talking about how it's sensitive to all these things that aren't light up. The first planet it published was a transiting planet. Um, and they, because they're measuring the um, positions of stars, they're also getting the brightness. So they have these light curves and they were able to find this one that had regular dips. And they checked the test data, hey, Tess, um, and they saw it there as well. So the first planet was actually a transiting planet. Um, so we haven't actually seen any astrometry planets out of Gaia yet. Those are supposed to come out, I think, in the final da Gaia mm -hmm. data release. Yeah. Data release four in 2023, I want to say. Right. Um, so again, even that's like the current space age, cutting edge technology. That's still giant planets. Um, so we're still not down to like rocky planets with astrometry yet. It's just the movement <laughs> induced by these rocky planets is so tiny. Um, it, it really feels like, you know, as, as tests say is the the finder scope for James Webb, uh, this astrometry method is going to be the finder scope for these direct imaging because the field of view on these giant telescopes is so tiny. You don't have time to just scan the sky looking, you know, is there, are there any planets of this star? Are there any planets? There's a lot of stars. And yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> and so hopefully uh, Gaia will dump out this list and go start here. Yeah, so there's actually a lot of, we call it precursor work. There's a lot of precursor work happening right now to develop the target list for these first generation, very large telescope instruments. Um, and, you know, as you say, there's only so many stars that are the right distance away where you could actually see an Earth, you could resolve like an Earth Sun kind of analog. Um, and we already have that list of stars. Like we know that list. But Gaia will tell us, for instance, their velocities uh, with time, uh, which will help us work out like group membership, which helps us work out how old they are. It's very hard to measure how old a star is, it turns out, uh, Hollywood or Celestial. Um, so that'll help us. And then we're also doing all of this radial velocity work from the ground. It turns out the stars around which you're most sensitive with direct imaging are also the stars where radial velocity helps you a lot. So there's a lot of precursor work happening with radial velocity to say, you know, is there any trend in this system, like over a very long period of time that would indicate there's some kind of companion? Is it quiet and is the star quiet enough with time that we could look for an Earth-like planet, or is the star just so active? Like some stars are just, you know, popping off all over the place um, that, you know, it'll just be too difficult to, you know, remove that stellar signal, which is changing so much in time and look for the planet signal. So there's all this precursor work happening with radio velocity and Gaia and, you know, large scale spectroscopic surveys that are happening uh, to, to really nail down that target list. Because as you say, time on these telescopes will be super precious and super yeah. expensive. So you want to have the best target list to look at that you have. Yeah, it was interesting. I was talking to, interviewed um, someone from the Space Telescope Institute last week, and we were talking about the, you know, they've they've mostly locked in the schedule for James Webb for its first year of observing. That's right. <clears throat> and it's so clever of the way that they're doing it that they're going to be, you know, bunching targets together so they're all in the same area. They're going to be gathering pictures while it's slewing to different locations like they've really organized and optimized right. the time spent with this telescope because the time is is so precious yeah. and it's going to be the same thing with these extremely large telescopes you're going to have a bunch of europeans fighting over um pointing it at this and pointing it at that right because yeah. everything everything looks better in a 40 meter telescope yeah 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 the, the, a lot of the time allocation committees on these large telescopes one of the things they have to differentiate is, is this something that could uniquely be done on a 40 meter telescope? Or is it just something that's a bit better on a 40 meter telescope than on a 10 meter telescope? Like, yeah. this is a very, you know, because as you say, a lot of people just want to be like, here's my favorite thing. I want to look at it with a 40 meter telescope. And they're like, mm. <laughs> yeah, we need, we need to be doing things that you can't do with your 10 meter telescope. Yeah, yeah. Use this, use this old uh, interferometer of 8.4 meter telescopes. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I'd like to shift a bit into, of course, everyone's favorite idea, the search for life. The What we went through over the last couple of years with the potential discovery of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, mm -hmm. I think showed us how difficult it is to detect some of these biosignatures around sure. a planet that's literally just right there. Right? right? Like, like Venus is, you know, it couldn't be Our closer. Our best prospect, and yeah. we're still arguing. Couldn't be closer, and yet... It's it's so tricky to detect this these these chemicals. Um, that really shattered my confidence for us being able to get any kind of definitive answer about whether we're seeing biosignatures on other planets. Is it going to be that tough? 
Yeah, I mean, honestly, even before the phosphine debate, you know, if people asked me, when are we going to find biosignatures, I would point out the fact people claimed the discovery of exoplanets for a hundred years before there were definitive actual, yes, this is incontrovertible, absolutely in exoplanet discoveries. And even then the radio velocity ones, some people were still like, well, it could just be a binary that's face on instead of edge on. Um, so there were still detractors. Um, but yeah, like in the 1850s, people were like, is that an exoplanet? And other astronomers were like, nah, probably not. Um, so I fully expect that there will be many claims of detections of biosignatures that are you know, just on the edge of the noise, right? Because we're just getting our technology to the point where we can just do it. So if you can imagine, you know, like a Gaussian spread of signals and, and our technology is like creeping down to the point of being able to detect them, you're going to get all the outliers to start with, all of the noise that's like, hey, I'm a three sigma event, but you looked at a hundred stars, here I am. Um, so that's going to happen because we're just at the edge of our detectability. But as we push down our detectability sensitivity and our instruments get better and, you know, our modeling gets better and our laboratory work gets better. So we understand more of the line lists that we need. We will get more and more confident of like, oh, that's definitely a phosphine line. There's nothing. It couldn't be a silicon or sulfur or something else line has to be phosphine. So I, I think it'll trend towards confirmation, but there will be a, a lengthy, probably not 100 years, just because the speed with which information is disseminated and observations can happen is much more rapid than 150 years ago. But uh, there will be some period of doubt. But do you, f I mean, the astrobiologists are still arguing over what a biosignature would be, because all of the really good candidates Oh, we found oxygen. Oh, we found ozone. Oh, we found methane. Each one, like again, we found methane on Mars. Is it life? A astrobiologists say, Mur. <laughs> so um, we still don't even have a definitive definition of a biosignature yet. Yeah, that's, I mean, we were having this discussion last week um, about how biosignature doesn't mean there's life. It means, you know, under some circumstances, life produces this. Uh, which, you know, all fast cars are red, all red cars are fast. It's not the same logic, right? Um, so it's a, I feel like we've done journalists a disservice by naming them biosignatures because it's not, it's not an exclusive thing. Like oxygen, as you say, there are geological origins of oxygen. Um, so there's a lot of work being done on this right now, trying to see if there's a, a specific molecule or a specific combination of molecules that together could really only be produced biologically. Um, so, for instance, this is one of the reasons why people are excited about phosphine. It's hard to make phosphine in very high concentrations with anything except some kind of biological process. Um, now, you know, the detection of phosphine is the tricky part because, you know, it's not a very common molecule. Uh, it's, you know, hard to detect. It's got lines that overlap with other much more common molecules. There's problems. Um, Obviously, the ideal biosignature is something that, you know, only gets made by life, is very easily separable from all of the other molecules. And, you know, is that a wavelength we can detect with an instrument that we have the technology to do it? We don't have that magic molecule yes. yet. We haven't worked yeah. out what that is. So that's the, that's the problem. Yeah. We're looking for it, but we haven't found it. Yeah, and so there's a lot of really interesting candidates, and each time someone goes, oh, how about this one? Other people yeah. go, oh, I, you know, that could be made by a volcano or whatever. Um, exactly. I mean, I think some of the interest, most likely ones or the most obvious ones would be things like, say, chlorofluorocarbons or the pollutants coming from a technological yeah, civilization. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of pivoting um, in interest towards technosignatures in the last, like, three to five years, mm -hmm. just when it's like – well, what, what could be incontrovertible? Like if you look out there and someone's shooting Morse code at you, then, you know, okay, we're probably not going to argue too much about whether a volcano can produce Morse code. We're going to be like, okay, cool. How do they know Morse code? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And so it does feel like, like, like this idea of looking for, like, it, it is interesting. And again, I know this isn't your field specifically, but who doesn't want to think about aliens in the universe? Um, <laughs> that that it's gone from the people looking for aliens were kind of ridiculed and underfunded. And then it sort of shifted into this idea of astrobiology and it got some funding. But mm -hmm. but you want to look for dumb aliens, not for smart aliens. And now there's sort of an it seems like there's actually an acceptance of saying, OK, smart alien hunters, you can join the conversation now and maybe get a little bit of funding and have some conferences and nobody's going to laugh at you. Too yeah, much. for sure. There's been that kind of cultural shift, which, you know, 
all of these people who've been tiring in this smart aliens field for decades, you know, good on them for sticking with it, yeah. uh, even in the face of no funding, basically. I mean, all of this breakthrough initiative and breakthrough stuff, that's all private funding, yeah. right? It was actually, um, SETI was actually barred from NASA funding for some period of time, ah. a decade or two, where it was actually explicitly stated in NASA proposal calls that you could not do SETI. Like that was not something that was under the auspices of this call. Yeah. Um, so it actually only got rewritten back in in the last decade. Like I want to say, even in the last five years. Yeah, Carl that Sagan. Thing. Carl Sagan would be pleased. I think. I think so too. Yeah. Um, so how? So then, I you know, each time we talk, I ask you to place your bets on on when you think we will find e either just like a like another Earth in the habitable zone. Like let's we'll start with that. When do you think that we will have the right machine online to make that discovery? a good question sun-sized so, sun-sized star earth-sized planet and mass in the habitable zone of its star let's start right. there so we have some kepler candidates that are low reliability meaning there are other noise in the data that look like them uh what we're trying to do very actively is to follow those up with hubble to see if we can see another transit of the putative planet which would confirm that it's not noise it's a real thing um after kepler died there was no way to go back into it so if we get Hubble time, please Hubble, give us time. If we get Hubble time, then we might be able to confirm something like that. Um, China is actually planning to launch uh, a, a Kepler 2.0, essentially, yep. like a, a meter telescope to go to space and go back to the Kepler field. So that might help. Um, there's a radio velocity concept called Earthfinder, um, which is hoping to push, get radio velocity in space, essentially. That would be sensitive to planets like the Earth. Um, I don't want to say microlensing because you can't do anything with yeah. microlensing planets. But when Roman goes up, Roman's actually sensitive to Earth-like planets in, in sunlike, in habitable zones of sun-like stars. Um, but those, you know, microlensing planets are so frustrating because you just never see them yeah. again. They happen yeah. once and you're like, cool. Yeah, yeah we, yeah, we found another Earth and now it's gone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I always like, you know, they get described as planets you can't see around stars you can't see. Um, right. So you never see them again. Um, so yeah, there's some prospects. Um, I would say that because the sciences, the scientists have gotten really distracted by M stars, right? Because yes. it's so easy to find rocky planets and habitable zones of M stars. I think that we need to resolve that first before, because it's so hard to find Earth-like planets around the, in the habitable zones of sun-like stars. That, and 10 years ago, that was the drive, that was the push, let's do it. And that's why Kepler got funded and launched. Um, but then, you know, it's hard. So Kepler didn't even really get there in the end, even with $600 million of funding. Um, and then we started to find all these rocky planets around stars where it's much easier to find them. So I think that's where the attention will and the money will probably be for a while until we work out, we've resolved this issue of whether or not they're actually habitable. Um, and then we might turn back to this question. But right now, there isn't like a huge science or funding push towards Earths around stars like the sun. All right, I'm going to need a date. That's that sounded to me like you might already know of the planet. You just need a little bit more Hubble time, so you could probably get at it in about a year. Mm -hmm. We have asked twice already for this yep. Hubble time and not gotten it. Okay. Uh, interestingly, just to insight into the process, the first year it was ranked in the top quintile, so the top twenty percent, and then the second year we resubmitted the proposal and it was ranked in the bottom quintile, mm. and it was basically the same proposal. So this is part of what I'm saying with this shift away from people caring about this. Right. Like they're, you know, in that same proposal, there were all of these, let's look at the atmospheres of ha M dwarf habitable zones. And the Hubble type was like, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, okay. there's, there's been a shift in priority. But the giant Magellan telescope, the 30 meter telescope, James Webb, the European extremely large telescope, they could all do those observations as well, right? Uh, ooh, ish. 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 I think even the large ground-based telescopes aren't quite at Earth-like planets in the habitable zones of stars like the sun at the age that we're at. Like maybe around really young systems, like less than 100 right. million years. If but even though thinking. Hubble, I guess you just, you just need Hubble to make those transit methods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hubble is just getting the transit because we've got what we have with Kepler are three kind of shaky events where it's like, if this is real, there should be a fourth event. If it's noise, there shouldn't be a fourth event. Like we've just happened, to, maybe right. we just happened to line up three little bibbly bits of noise right. to make a transit. And that tricky part of it of it taking a year between events. That's right. You don't get a lot of chances. Yeah, but that's part of the that's problem. that's what you want. But for you it to need be that. you need at least a one meter telescope in space to do it because these transits are you know 
50 parts per million change in brightness. This is such a tiny dip in the brightness change of the sky. So it really, what was lost with Kepler's stupid gyros failing? Right. What was lost was our ability to get to Earth-like planets in habitable zones of sun like the, stars like the sun. So we originally proposed for a four-year mission, which was the right length of time if other stars like the sun had the same amount of noise as our sun. And we just kind of guessed that our sun would be average, just totally normal. Why would our sun be special? Turns out our sun is special. Uh, it turns out our sun is quieter than most other G, F, K stars around us. Um, and what that meant was in four years, we didn't have the sensitivity to Earth-like planets that we thought we would have. We went back to NASA and said, "Can if you give us three more years, if we could have a seven-year mission instead of a four-year mission, we can recover that sensitivity. We need, we'll get more transits. We'll add them together and our signal to noise will come back up. And they were like, yes, fantastic. Yeah. And then like one month into that three years, the second reaction will broke. So we never, so if you look at our sensitivity curves, we just never got down to Earth. Earth is like down here and the big lump of planets that Kepler found in planet and radius spaces, like a period and radius spaces up here. So we just never got there. And that's, so, you know, as someone who worked on the Kepler mission for 10 years, it's like, oh, such a heartbreak because we yeah. got so close. But, and then you have to extrapolate, right? Then you have to take all of the shorter period planets and be like, okay, if they keep increasing the way we expect, uh, then this is what the number of Earths should be. Or you take the bigger planets and say, well, if they keep increasing the way we see, this is the number of planets. But everybody has their own way of extrapolating, their own, you know, where are you anchoring the data? There's huge uncertainty still. And there's no Kepler replacement in the works from anybody, except for Not China. Not from NASA, but, but China. Yeah. Um, so Plato is this European mission that I mission that I mentioned. It's it is smaller telescopes. They're much smaller than Kepler, yeah. um, but they are they do have the ability to kind of overlap. Um, so they are going to go back to the Kepler field in the current plan and put the overlap region of these like twenty six telescopes on the field. It will not have the same sensitivity as Kepler. If, you know, even if you add up twenty six small telescopes, you, it's very difficult to get to the quality of a one meter telescope. Um, so they're hoping to be able to come back to these candidates that I talked about and maybe recover some of those transits. If we don't get the Hubble time, that's our next hope for those. Um, but it's not going to be able to find new candidates that are Earth-sized planets around stars like the sun. This is about confirming the one, the small number of ones we have from Kepler. Yeah. Now, are there any other clever ideas that you really like for potentially finding planets? And I'll give you an example just to sort of, sort of show you where my mind is going. There's this idea of putting a radio telescope on the far side of the moon with the sensitivity of detecting um, magnetospheres around exoplanets through the interactions of the star. And so you would literally, you'd get a twofer. You, you would find out that there's a planet there. And also you would find out that that planet has a protective magnetosphere, which would be quite exciting. Um, yes. So that's just one idea of alternative. Are there any other alternative planet hunting ideas that, that you find really fascinating? Um, that's a really good question. Um... I like the, like, if we're talking of alternative things, I like these ideas of, you know, putting a telescope on the other side of the sun that uses the sun as a lens so that you can, you know, magnify background events and look more closely for things like directly imaged planets. That's a really cool idea. I mean, it's pretty far out there, but if it works, you know, the math works out. Whether the technology works right. out is another question, but the math checks out that you could use the sun as basically a giant lens. But all you have to do is take a spacecraft up to 1,000 astronomical units away from the yeah. from earth and that's then, what i'm saying yeah the, tech, the tech's not yeah. there but the but the math is there so it's mostly bigger better but then in in the long term like when we do have that 50 million planets and we look back and say well, how did we get here what was the technique that got us those planets was it astrometry was it direct imaging or was it because it feels like it rate of velocity direct, and... Im direct imaging is still just too one at a time right you, you find direct imaging planets one at a time you know the big contributors to exoplanet populations are the surveys where you can do hundreds of stars thousands of stars hundreds of thousands of stars at once so astrometry with gaia ha, ha, is doing hundreds of thousands of stars um micro is going to you know the roman survey is going to do a 500 day micro lensing survey of the bulge it's expected to find like a hundred thousand planets uh, because it's staring at the bulge, which is very, very densely populated with stars for 500 days. Uh, and, you know, it's a two and a half meter telescope, so it's going to do all right in terms of precision. It's not exactly what it's designed for, but, you know, exoplanet scientists will use any telescope <laughs> that you even give them a whiff of a chance of using to do exoplanet science. So yeah. we're going to we're going to do it. Um, 
So that'll be 100,000 planets. If you look at this this trend that we talked about, this exponential rise, if you look at it in log space, um, the big contributors will be Tess and Gaia and Roman over the next decade. Um, Plato might have some discovery space, although, you know, as I said, because it's this hybrid of Kepler and Tess, a lot of that low-hanging fruit will be done. Um, and if Earth 2.0, this China mission goes back to the Kepler field, it's not going to discover a whole bunch of new things. It's going to do a better job of making the Kepler candidates more reliable. Right. Um, I mean, in addition to you, you know, taking advantage of every telescope you can get your hands on, you're also a community that is welcoming of amateurs with good gear to help confirm exoplanets as well. So if people, if people want to, you know, and even like the telescope like I have behind me, if a person wants to get involved in in this science and they don't, you know, they don't want to go through the, you know, the rigorous uh, multi-year doctorate program that you did, um, yeah. how, how can they get, how can they participate? Absolutely. So actually the success of TESS 100% relies on the contribution of a very large community of amateur astronomers. So let me explain why. The way that TESS can do this all sky survey is because its pixels are huge. It has 21 arc second pixels. You can fit a lot of stars in 21 arc seconds. Um, so what happens is on that pixel, we see that something is changing in flux. The, the computer says something here is periodically changing. What we then need is telescopes on the ground that have much higher resolution, much higher spatial resolution, like, you know, depends on the seeing at your site, you have one or two arc second seeing or three arc second seeing or whatever you have, you can actually resolve this field. And we tell you, this is when a transit would happen. Um, and you look with your small telescope, it, people are doing this with backyard telescopes and see which of those stars is changing in brightness. Um, now, if it's the brightest star and the change in brightness is very, 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 very shallow, you might not see it. But what you see is that none of the other background stars change by a huge amount. And that's really important because if none of the other stars change by a huge amount during that time, we know that it must be a shallow event on the real star. Right. So that's still great. Um, and, you know, this program has been going for years now. So the software is all really highly developed and easy to use. Uh, there's a really, you know, there's all these websites to help people like find what's transiting up in their backyard. You know, one of the websites I run is where you upload your data afterwards so that we can look at it and be like, yay, nay. Um, so yeah, so absolutely. If you want to get involved, um, I guess you could email me or you could email Karen Collins. Karen Collins is the subgroup one lead. Subgroup one is the, it's called number one because it's the most important. That's the ground-based follow-up photometry. Uh, she's the lead of subgroup one. Um, and we have, you know, dozens of people around the world and then people who contribute get to be on papers. Like we use hmm. the data in the discovery papers and we credit people on the papers. They get to be co-authors. And so what kind of gear does a person require to be able to participate in this? So you need to have a CCD on your on your telescope because what we need to measure is to measure the brightness of the star over many, many hours. Um, the telescope needs to be able to track, like let's be real, the telescope needs to be able to track um, to get good photometry. Um, everything else is basically just the software will help you through the rest, which is basically like identifying all of the stars in the field, creating these light curves where you add up all of the light from the stars. It even does some basic detrending, like all of the stars, for instance, are rising and falling at the same amount of time. So going through the same amount of atmosphere and the software will be like, okay, this is what the air mass is. I'm going to correct for that because it's going to change the total brightness. Um, so the software does a lot of the actual heavy lifting in terms of the data analysis uh, and produces all these pretty plots for you to look at and be like, oh, look, it's on the target star. Oh, it's on this background right. star. Um, I'm getting a little bit of mic noise from you. I'm so sorry. you're just, I'm, yeah. I'm probably wailing that's, around. The, 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 that's totally fine. It's appreciated, encouraged. But yeah, something is sort of whacking your, your mic as you go. So mm -hmm. I want to bring in some, some questions uh, from the audience who are watching, and they've got a bunch of, so if you've got some planet questions. So Adam Synergy asks, is dis disequilibrium in a planet's atmosphere a potential biosignature? It's a potential biosignature the way a lot of these are potential biosignatures, but you know, it could also be tectonic activity, volcanic activity. I mean, you know, if your, if your atmosphere is in, if your ocean's in the process of evaporating, you know, if there's any reason why your planet is not changing and lots of planets are changing, then it's not a biosignature, but it is a potential biosignature. Right. The worst kind of bias. The exactly. Worst, the yeah. ambiguous kind. Yeah, exactly. Um, Hal McKinney asks, are there any commonalities as to how each solar system's ecli ecliptic planes orient themselves relative to some other object like the galactic center? Is there any standard direction that planetary systems are orbiting? I see. No, actually, if you look at the distributions of orbits across the sky, they're uh, isotropic. They're just randomly distributed. There's no like great plane in which everything is is rotating, um, which is, you know, 
interesting and tells you about the local angular momentum when the star cloud that created the star in the system was compared to like the larger scale Milky Way galaxy. But yeah, no preferred orbital direction. Well, I mean, it actually sort of does tell us a little bit about the formation of the the galaxy and, and the stars in the galaxy because, you know, here in the solar system, we see the sun and the planets and the moons and everything is all ordered in that way. And so we say it all had to be this singular event that brought them all together. And yet you can see each star dances to its own special tune. And so yeah, clearly each little pocket of gas had its own initial momentum in some direction. Yeah, I wonder if they are, I know this is sort of outside your field, but I wonder if in a nebula, they're similar. Yeah, you know, it's been hard to cluster. find lots of planets in clusters, uh, in part because they're crowded, uh, um, so it's hard to get good photometry. Um, in part because a lot of the clusters we've looked at are metal poor, and it turns out, so there's not a lot of heavy elements in their stars, and it turns out that means it's harder to make planets. So, you know, some of the early exciting studies of clusters turned up nothing, and that was really disappointing. Um, but yeah, I don't think I don't think there's been a statistical study of like a given cluster that has some kind of you know, net momentum, like, does that translate? I mean, something we see with the planetary systems we do see is evidence of, you know, dynamic evolution of the system. We see things like, for instance, where the star is rotating this way, but the planet's going retrograde, like the planet's actually orbiting in the other direction. Or we see things where the, the planet and the star are at 90 degrees to yes. each other in terms of the, like, the polar orbit, the planet's going around the top of the star. Um, so we see, we do see evidence that planetary systems have changed with time, and you know, in particular, they've changed orbital, you know, elements like eccentricity and inclination have they've exchanged energy. So it's hard to look now at a picture of a system and be like, this is what's its angular momentum when it was born. Um, uh, Bandit Buster is asking, have you found Tatooine yet? Or you know, obviously, we we have found we have found multiple Tatooine-like systems. Um, uh, so Kepler sixteen b was the first one of these. So Tatooine being this classic, you know, you know, New Hope, Luke standing on the surface looking at the binary star setting. Um, one of my favorite parts is that you know it's a yellow star and a red star. And actually, if you look at Kepler sixteen, it's a yellow star and a red star. Oh, it's perfect. Um, so he even got the colors right. George Lucas is like, you know. This, this is like 20 plus years before we'd even found the first planet. He's like, no, I, I get it. I get it. There's going to be two stars. One's going to be yellow. One's going to be red. It's going to be great. Um, so we have found multiple Tatooine-like systems, which is pretty exciting. What is the what is the configuration that makes them stable? Because you would, you would imagine the interactions between two stars would cause some mayhem. So what does it take? Yeah. So there's basically two situations where you can have multiple stars with planets. One is that the stars are so close together and the planet is so far away that the gravitational well that the two stars make is effectively a point source, right? That you, the planet is far enough away um, that it, it can treat them like one star. They're so close together. There's actually this dynamical stability radius where you can't get too close or that, that assumption breaks down. You can't assume they're a single, it just can't treat them like a single point source of mass anymore. Um, and so it's actually one of the things we've seen when we find these Tatooine-like planets is this like pile up of planets right at this stability limit. Um, and I think the jury is still out on whether that's a detection bias because it gets harder and harder to find longer period planets um, or whether it is some actual you know evidence of the dynamical evolution like these planets you know migrate in and then a bunch of them just get sucked in and like flung out you know they, they get too close to the star and then patoing, this cool three-body interaction happens yeah. and so this whole intersection gets cleared out um, so that's really cool. So that's situation one, which is the planet is far enough away from the stars. Situation two is where the stars are far enough apart uh, and the planet is close enough to one of the stars that it can effectively treat the faraway star like it's not part of the system. So this is what we see, for instance, in the uh, Alpha Centauri system. So you have Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B, and Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is far enough away from the other two stars that it's completely fine to have planets around them. Um, so Alpha Centauri A and B are actually fairly close. So there are actually limits on how on where planets could be around those stars and be stable. Mm -hmm. um, now, you, you briefly mentioned planets getting kicked out uh, going rogue um it's it's interesting how many of these rogue planets are starting to be found through microlensing mainly at this point what do you think about the potential for there being exoplanets without stars yeah no i mean we've seen these so microlensing and also direct imaging like sky surveys you just see these very sky surveys in like the infrared and the mid infrared you see these just like little a little glowing hunk going through the sky and you can tell from how cool it is and how small it is that it's just you know a giant planet or maybe a brown dwarf just kind of floating out there um 
There was some a claim a few years ago from microlensing that there were as many free-floating planets or rogue planets in the galaxy as stars. That's been walked back a bit now. Uh, it was, you know, based on not a lot of data. Um, so there's been more data now, and we think that's probably wrong by an order of magnitude or two. Uh, but it still seems like there has to be a pretty large reservoir of rogue planets in the Milky Way in order to for this excess of very short period microlensing events that we see. And, you know, people who do evolution of our solar system, um, there's a theory that there was a fifth giant planet in our solar system uh, that got kicked out sometime in the interaction. You know, there's a theory that Jupiter and Saturn swapped places at some point. Um, and when that happened, like a, a fifth body might have, a fifth giant planet might have gotten ejected. So we might have like a long lost sibling out there just wandering between the stars. And, and even the potential for them to just form in situ, just form in place. Yeah, the giant planets might have just formed, you know, there's two ways we think planets form. One is a collapse of a, of a gas, which is the same way stars form. So at the very tail end of star formation, the very smallest little gas clouds can collapse. And maybe they just don't have enough mass in the center to ignite fusion. So they're brown dwarfs or they're, or they're giant planets. And then there's core accretion, which is bottom up, which is like pebbles stick together and make rocks and rocks stick together and make planets. And that starts accreting gas. And then you have a planet. So there's the upper end of that. And there's the lower end of star formation. And then there's this population in the middle where we don't know what the dominant, you know, contributing formation scenario is. And that's something that people are actually working on like right now. Uh, yeah. So these, these isolated giant planets may have just formed from a tiny pocket of gas, just got perturbed by like a nearby star and boom, collapse. Jesse, uh, absolute pleasure to talk with you as always. Thank you so much for the update. If people want to follow what you're working on and keep track of the planet counts, where should they go? So the planet counts are at the NASA Exoplanet Archive. Uh, check that out. Um, that, that's actually mostly aimed at professional astronomers. JPL has its eyes on exoplanets public portal, which basically uses our catalog to make this pretty explore the universe version of the archive. So eyes on exoplanets is a great place to go to check out the latest discoveries. I'm on Twitter at Aussie Astronomer without the E, A-U-S-S-I Astronomer. Um, and yeah, follow me there and, and we'll talk exoplanets. And if people do have the gear and want to participate and want to have their names on papers and help discover exoplanets, reach out to you. Yes, you reach out to me or search for Karen Collins uh, and you'll find her email address. She's on the test page. Uh, she's the subgroup one lead and she's the one, you know, administering our flock of, of community contributed scientists, which is excellent. Terrific. Well, thank you so much and good thank luck you. with all of the planets. I can't wait for, to hear the uh, official announcement after you get your Hubble time. Yay. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. me too. <laughs> all right. Thanks.